Thanks to the men who led prayers this morning. Bruce, who led the good singing. And thanks to Daniel for reminding us of the cross of Christ. Jesus died on that cross to keep us pure. To make us holy. This morning we're going to finish up what I started last summer. First and second Thessalonians. He started talking about judgments from 1 Thessalonians 4.13 and on. He did that clear into 2 Thessalonians 2.17. And in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, he talks specifically about judgment coming. And then he tells them from verse 12 and following how to be prepared for that coming. Now he's going to end 2 Thessalonians his last letter to the Thessalonian brethren, and he's going to end it the same way. He's talking about, as we talked about before, the judgment, the judgment on those that follow Satan in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12, and the glory of those that are in Christ, 2 Thessalonians 3, excuse me, 2, 13, yeah, 13 to 17. And then he's going to tell you in chapter 3 how to be prepared for that coming of the Lord again. And he's going to talk about, he requests prayer for him, and then he gives his last commandment in regard for them to be prepared for the Lord's coming. And he's going to tell us in that that idleness is not to be tolerated. Idleness is a sin that God will not accept. And he tells the church what to do in regards to idle people. These are Paul's final statements to these people. And I think... Paul ended up talking to them on a on maybe a negative side of what to do, talking about church discipline. And I'm going to end up my time here this summer talking to you about a subject that's not popular. And I thought, I don't want to end up my time talking about a subject that's not popular. And then I thought, if Paul wrote that, that's God's will. And I would be delinquent if I didn't preach the whole gospel of God. Amen. This is God's word for the church. And it is what's necessary to keep the church pure and ready for the coming of the Lord. Ethan just read 3, 1 through 5, so we won't take time there. Go back and study it yourself. We want to see the warning against idleness is what we're talking about today. Our God, as Daniel talked about, this Lord's Supper, Jesus suffered an excruciating pain and agony on the cross so that we could be holy. He tells us in Christ, Christ is our wisdom, he's our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. Christ is everything. And he did all that, that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and without blemish. That's in uh, Ephesians 5, 27. God will not, God cannot tolerate less than holiness. Our God is holy. He tells you in 1 Peter 1.15, as he who called you is holy, be yourselves also holy in all manner of, love, uh, of living. As it is written, and he quotes Leviticus 19.2, when he says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Holy. Verse 6 gives the commandment. Paul says, I command you. This is not a request. 
He says, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, it's not me, but by the authority and the word of Jesus Christ, I'm commanding you to withdraw from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the traditions which you receive from us. He makes a commandment. And if we were to look at the Old Testament to see how God, God deals with delinquent people, if we would look back in the book of Joshua, where they have prepared and they now have crossed the Jordan River into the promised land. And the first fruits of the promised land, remember, the first fruits always belong to God. Don't touch God's first fruits. And he'll tell you what happens to people that does that. In, jo in Joshua 6, where Joshua is receiving the instructions on the taking of Jer uh, Jericho, when he tells him how to do that, then he'll tell him. In chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, But as for you, only keep yourself from the devoted thing. Lest when you have devoted it, you take the devoted thing, so you would so it would make your camp of Israel accursed. You take the devoted thing, you will be accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and the vessels of iron and, and uh, brass are holy unto Jehovah. But we see in chapter 7, we're not going to take time to read the chapter. We don't have time. You can follow in the book if you would like to open your Bibles to Joshua 7. In verse 7 he says, But the children of Israel did they trespass in the devoted thing. We see in verses 3 and 4 that Joshua sent 3,000 men up to take the small place of Ai. And when they get up there, rather than them winning, they get chased out of there and 36 of them get killed. And the reaction of Jer Joshua and the elders in verses 6 down through 9 says, And Joshua fell on his face with the elders before the Ark of Covenant and tore their clothes and put dust on their head and cried unto Jehovah, why weren't we pleased to stay on that side of the Jordan? We've come over here and now we're reproached and the Canaanites will all assemble themselves and destroy our name. 10 and 11, God says, get up. Get up. What do you down there on your face? God says, it's not time to pray. It's time to be doing something. And he goes on to tell them in verses 12 and 13, Jehovah tells them that sin is in the camp. And when sin is in the camp, which is the church today, God is not with you. You cannot win. Your, your enemies will defeat you because I am not with you. And then he tells them what to do about it. He says the devoted thing must be taken away. And he tells you then when this is supposed to take place. Church discipline takes place when? Now when they fell on their face, that's in the evening. And he says, early in the morning you get up. You gather all of Israel. And God chooses from all of Israel the tribe who took of the devoted thing. And then he takes for the tribe he chooses the family, and from the family he chooses Achan. And Achan confesses his sin in 20 and 21. He confesses exactly what he's done. But in 22 and 23, Joshua sends men to his tent to prove it. No discipline takes place in the church without proof of the sin. He, they go and prove it, even though he confessed it. They prove it. And then in 25, all Israel stones him and his family and burns them with fire. And the result, chapter 8, verse 1. Fear not. 
Take all of Israel, go against Ai, for I have given them into your hand. Victory returns to Israel when they get rid of the sin that's in the midst of them. Now the same thing. He tells you, I didn't mention Romans 15.4 before I went there, should have. Romans 15.4 tells you that the things written before were written for our learning. That through patience and comfort of the scripture we might have hope. In the other passage there, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, he starts out talking about Israel, and they're coming out of Egypt. They're buried in baptism unto Moses under the cloud through the sea. And when he takes them over there, their baptism was to cleanse them and make them pure. Into the wilderness they go. A holy people chosen by God himself. They go into fornication. They go into idolatry. They go into murmur, and God destroys them. All the adult people that came out of Egypt die in that wilderness. Why? Sin in the camp. Only Joshua and Caleb, out of all that multitude, goes into the promised land. God does not tolerate sin. So he tells us the New Testament reality of what happened in Joshua. The passage I just mentioned, I command you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother that walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you received of us. Withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly. Now the word disorderly is a military term. It is a term for one that is walking out of step. One that is out of step or out of rank or an army marching in disarray. And it became to speak of anything that is out of order. The word disorderly is an adjective that describes the walking. Now the walking is a present participle which, can, which is a stress of continual action. So we're not talking about somebody that stumbles and falls. We all stumble and sin. 1 John 1, 7 tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us of all of our sins. That's stumbling. That's not what he's talking about. This guy is walking disorderly. Not just a stumble. He's walking disorderly because it's not after the traditions which you receive from us. The standard is the word of God. Not my thoughts, not anybody's thoughts. It's the word of God. That's the standard. The word disorderly is used again in the next verse. It's used again in verse 11 to tell you clearly in this context, in this context, exactly what Paul's talking about, the disorderly. Because he'll tell you in verse 11 that some among you walk disorderly not working at all, but are busybodies. So his dis, uh, disorderly here is speaking about idle people. People that are not working. He says they don't work at all, and they're busybodies. And the Bible tells you, you don't fellowship such people. Now, there's many sins of which the Bible tells you not to have fellowship. We don't disfellowship people because they're not doing what we want them to do. We don't disfellowship people because they want to paint the building red and you want it black. We disfellowship people who are walking outside 
of the law and the word of God. And God tells you exactly who these people are. It's not left up to our choice. He will tell you in 1 Corinthians 5, he'll give you a list in that chapter. But he'll say in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, he said, it's actually reported that there's fornication among you. And a fornication such as not even amongst the Gentiles that one of you has his father's wife. And you're puffed up. They're proud of the fact that they're big-hearted. They're accepting this thing. Paul says that you're puffed up and rather not grieve that this one that has done this deed be put away from among you. For I verily, absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already, as though I were present with you, judged the one that has done this deed. He said... There's sin in the camp. And you can't stand. Now what do you do with those that are sinning in the camp? He'll tell you in verse 4 and 5. Going on from where we led off there. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Ye being gathered together. By the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan. Deliver him to Satan. Why do we do this? He tells you in verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be sold in the day of the Lord. We're back to judgment day. That the soul may be saved in the day of the Lord. The number one thing we do when we discipline people is to try to deliver their souls. We're not mad at that person. We're not angry with that person. We should be grieved in our heart. We go to that person with tears in our eyes because we're concerned for the salvation of a soul that's going to spend eternity in only one of two places. It is done because of love. Love demands that we do what is the best for that person. And in the position he's in, he's outside of Christ. He has no hope. Another reason he'll tell you on down in verse 6 and 7 is to keep the church pure. He says in verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, even as you are unleavened. For our Passover is already offered even Jesus Christ. He is our holiness. He says, you purge out that old leaven. Keep the church pure. So the second reason... That discipline takes place is to keep the church pure and holy. There's another reason that we see back in Acts 5. We know in Acts 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife, who lied to the Holy Spirit about how much money they gave. And God sent fire and killed them right there. So you're not to fellowship people that's idle. You're not to fellowship liars. And he says in verse 11 of chapter 5 of Acts, And great fear came upon the whole church. So that's the third reason. For the church to realize that the church cannot, if they're going to walk in Christ, cannot tolerate sin. And not only that, he goes on in that same verse to say, and unto all that heard these things. That's to let all the people around his church. The church is built, God says, I'll set my church up on the hill. And it is to be the shining light. Jesus said a city set on the hill can't be hidden. That's supposed to be the church. The church is up here as a shining light. We can't be a shining light if everybody around us knows that we tolerate sin. 
So the purpose, the purpose of discipline is to save the soul of the sinner. It is to keep the church pure and to make the church realize that there's that we cannot tolerate sin being in the church and to let the whole community around us know that the church is the only special place that is in Christ Jesus. It's holy. Who do we discipline? We've already seen you discipline the idol. You discipline the liars. And they'll tell you on, we started in 1 uh, Corinthians 5, and we went down through 1 through 7. I eliminated 8 there. In verse 9 he says, I wrote unto you in my epistle to have no company with fornicators. Not at all speaking to the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or the revilers, or the idolaters, else you're going to have to leave the world. But I wrote, as it is, I wrote unto you to not keep company if any man be named a brother that is a fornicator, is covetous, is an idolater, is a reviler, is a drunkard, or a one that's a cheater. He's a cheater. Such a one as this, no, not even to eat. You don't even eat with him. As he says in 2 Thessalonians 3, withdraw from him. You don't even eat with him. He lists five, six things there that you don't fellowship. You don't even eat with these people if he's named a brother. Fornicators. Covetous. <laughs> you ever heard of a person being withdrawn from for covetousness? idolaters, anything that stands between you and God, whether it's our hunting and our fishing or our jobs or our family, whatever it is, anything that gets between you and your God is an idol. Is an idol. Revilers, drunkards, cheaters, you don't eat with them. And he goes on to say, for what have I do? Or for what have I do to judge in those that are without? Do not ye even judge those that are within? And those that are without, God judges, put away the wicked man from among yourselves. That's a commandment of Paul. Those people, he'll tell you in Romans 16, I beseech you, verse 17, I beseech you, brethren, that you mark them that cause division and occasions of stumbler, stumbling contrary to the doctrine which you learned and turn away from them. For men as such are not serving the Lord but their own belly. And with their food smooth and fair speech they devile, devile the hearts of the innocent. False teachers are to be put out from amongst us. We talked Wednesday night in our class. A murderer is not dangerous to a Christian. All he can do is kill your physical body and send you straight to heaven. But a false teacher can condemn your souls to an eternity in hell. False teachers are more dangerous than murderers. Paul says you turn away from them. In Titus 3, 10 and 11, he says a factious man... A factious man, after the first and second admonition, refuse, knowing that such a one is perverted and sinneth and is self-condemned. Factious people get into the church. They make a click over here and a click over here, and they have their own little people, and they cause divisions. Paul says to the Corinthian brethren, you say that I am a disciple of Paul, a disciple of Apollos, a disciple of Peter, a disciple of Christ? Paul says, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? Divisive people. Get them out. They'll cause the church to split. There's one more. 
2 Thessalonians 3, after he tells you in verse 6 who to withdraw from, he gets down in verse 14. And he says, if any man obeys not our words by this epistle, note that man that you have no company with him, that he might be ashamed. These are the people who God commands us to withdraw from. Not to have fellowship with these people. How do we go about this? Jesus tells you, when we talk about discipline, often when we talk about discipline, we think about withdrawn for somebody. That's the last step. Discipline is to try to save souls. Purify the church. But you don't start by withdrawing Jesus tells you in Matthew 18 how you go about this. He said, if thy brother sin against you, go. Show him his fault between him and you alone. Nobody else's business. Don't tell somebody about what your brother did. You go to your brother. Amen. That is violated over and over again. Jesus says, go. You don't talk to anybody. Show him his fault between him and you alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Nobody else needs to be involved. That's it, the end of it. If he hears you not, take one or two others that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word can be established. And if he refuses them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses them, let him be as a Gentile and a publican. That means he's outsider. Tell it to the church. You start with you talking to the man. Then you take a witness or two. Then you bring it to the church and the whole church gets involved in trying to get this man to quit his sin and come back to walking in the Lord. But if he refuses that, then he is walking disorderly. And he is to be considered a Gentile and a publican. Now this last State that Jesus speaks of is what Paul's speaking of when we talked in 1 Corinthians 5. In verse 4, he tells you how you do this. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the name of our Lord Jesus, ye being gathered together in the power of the Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan as we already saw. That's how you do it. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 3, 6, you withdraw from those brethren. And he goes on in 14. Beware. This is not a pleasant task that needs to be done, but God doesn't give you the choice of doing it or not doing it. This is a commandment that you do. To save souls, souls of people spend eternity in one of two places. Jesus died as we just celebrated his death, which means everything to us. Outside of that death of Jesus, there is no reason for anybody to do anything. We just wait to go to hell. But because of what Jesus did, we are promised eternity in heaven if we walk in Christ. If we maintain our holiness. Our holiness is in Jesus. Jesus is our justification. Jesus is our holiness. If we walk in Jesus, we are reckoned before God as holy and righteous. Not what we did, what Jesus did. 
But we have to walk in Jesus. We have to be baptized into Jesus. We have to walk by the Spirit in Jesus to maintain that promise of God of eternal life with Him. That's the whole purpose of what Paul's talking about here. Remember, when God talked to Ezekiel, Jehovah comes to Ezekiel and says, you're a watchman. And what's a watchman do? Watches. That's right. If your brother sins and you do not warn him, he will die in his sins. We're in Ezekiel 3, 17 to 21. If he sins and you do not warn him, he'll die in his sins and his blood I'll require at your hand. If your brother sin and you warn him and he doesn't repent, he will die in his sins, but his blood will not be in your hands. Our purpose is to get our brethren to repent that their souls can be saved. But if they refuse that, at least by warning him, we will save our own souls. And God says, if you don't warn him, all of his blood's fallen in your hands. So Paul goes on to say, Be ye imitators of Paul. 7 to 15. We don't have time to discuss that in detail, but he says right there, yourselves know that you ought to imitate us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. There's your word disorderly. You're to withdraw from those that are walking disorderly. And we gave you an example that you're to follow. Because we did not walk disorderly. And you're to imitate us. Paul tells you over and over again, be ye imitators of me. He says in 1 Corinthians 4.16. He says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, be ye imitators of me. Listen to what he tells the Philippian brethren in chapter 3. Verse 17, he says, brethren, be ye imitators of me and mark them that so walk, even as you have us as examples. Four. Many walk of whom I told you often and tell you now even weeping that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is perdition. Their God is their bellies. Their glory is in their shame. They mind earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven. Whence we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will fashion the body of our humiliation into the body of his glory, according to the working whereby he is able to subject all things unto himself. Our citizenship is in heaven. Walk as heavenly people. Don't be out here in the slime of the mud of this world. We are called to a higher plane, a higher level. There's a song that talks about raising us up to higher planes. We walk on a higher plane. We got to be up here. We have to be an example. Everybody's an example. You hear pro athletes say, well, I don't want to be an example. Well, forget it. You already are. And you don't have to be a pro athlete. Everybody is an example for somebody. Somebody is watching you. You can't hide. You are influencing somebody's life. Get up on this hill. Be the light that Jesus says and shine into the world. Going on. Neither did we eat bread at naught in anybody's hand, but we labored day and night that we've not burdened any of you that we not burden any of you. Idleness causes burdens on people. There's no free meals. Somebody pays. He told them back in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11, study 
to be quiet. Now the word study there in the American Standard means to give yourself to. Put all your energy towards being quiet. Do your own business. Work with your hands as we charged you. Be quiet. You strive to be quiet. You do your own business. You work with your hands. That, he tells you, the purpose in verse 11, that you may walk becomingly before those that are without, and that you have need of nothing. We do this to be a magnet that draws people to Christ. We can't draw people to Christ when they see a bunch of slothful people and they're claiming to be Christians. That's the reason Paul says, you withdraw from these people. They are the, they're the example of a stumbling block. He goes on to say, not because we have not the right. They have the right to demand as preachers the support of the people. Paul says in Thessalonica that they work night and day, laboring and travail, night and day that there be no burden because Thessalonica had a problem of idleness. Therefore, Paul says he didn't take anything from them. But we need to remember all the time he was preaching at Thessalonica, he was being supported by Philippi. So he was being supported as a preacher. But he tells the Corinthian brethren, who also he didn't take any money from, he says in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, about verse 11, he said, if we sow it into you the spiritual things, is it any great matter if we reap your carnal things? He says the things we're giving you are so far superior that your carnal things are just immaterial. Where have I gotten here? Not to that one yet. Goes on to say in the same chapter, in verse 14, even so, Christ appointed, Christ ordained that they that proclaim the gospel should live of the gospel. Paul said he had every right, but he didn't use it because he wanted to be an example of a working Christian there. In Galatians 6, 6 and following, he says, They that are taught in the word, let them communicate to those that teach us every good thing. He goes on to say in the next verse, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. If you sow unto the flesh, you'll receive of the flesh corruption. If you sow unto the spirit, you'll receive of the spirit eternal life. So we are to support those that preach us. But Paul says in Thessalonica, he wanted to give himself an example. Now we're out of time. I want to mention two more things as quickly if I'm, if I'm able to mention things quickly. In verse 10, even as when we were with you, we commanded you that if any will not work, neither let him eat. Paul goes clear back to Acts 17. He says when we were with you, we were telling you these things. And then he wrote 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12, which I mentioned a while ago, that you study to be quiet, work with your hands, do your own business, that you may be an example to those outside and you have need of nothing. And now he's telling them again, these people have begun, if they ever quit, they're taking care of idle people. Now we know that because of the command which isn't clear in English. Neither let them eat. That is an imperative. That is a command. The command 
is a present imperative. That means a continual action. These people are eating. But the command is negated. Neither let them eat. The negated present imperative, for you, you people that like grammar, means stop doing what you're doing. In this situation, it means stop feeding those people. You're supporting sinful people. Notice, the commandment is not to the idol. The commandment is to the church who are sustaining idleness. You withdraw from these people. Love demands that we do what is best for the individual. Idleness will bring judgment upon them. I'd like to talk about verse 14 and 15. We don't have time. He just says, people that don't agree with the word of God have no company with them. Verse 15 says, yet count them not as an enemy, but admonish them as brethren. You don't fellowship them, you don't socialize with them, you don't eat with them, but every opportunity you get, you admonish them to bring them back to Christ. Paul ends this letter, as I said before, in a strong statement of discipline. That is so that the church is prepared for the coming of Christ. Souls are prepared for the coming of Christ. If any is not in Christ, you have no hope. Get in Christ. If any of you have named the name of Christ and are walking disorderly, get back in Christ. The only thing that matters in all of our life is being right with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to face him in, in judgment. So if anybody needs to get into Christ or anybody needs to come back to Christ, let your necessities be known. We're going to stand and sing. Come down and let us know so that you can get into Christ as we stand and sing.